Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to my book reading. My name is Matt Lawson. I'm the executive director here at the Historical Museum. Uh, first and foremost, welcome. Uh, we are doing these series of virtual book reads as a way to promote our new virtual book sale, which kicks off today, December 2nd. And we're incredibly excited to uh, to try this opportunity. So for those of you who don't know, we do a book sale every year in November. It's been incredibly successful over the years. Uh, it's become our, frankly, biggest fundraiser. But due to the challenges with COVID-19 this year, we're unable to actually hold our annual book sale. So what we decided to do was to host this virtual book sale, uh, which will help fund things like educational programs and preservation programs here at the museum. Um, the way we're doing it is we are doing a series of readings, many of which are books that will be for sale. And I'll tell you about mine here in just a second. Uh, it's an interesting selection of books. Uh, they will be available through eBay. Um, and I'll tell you how to get to that link here in just a second. Uh, one other neat note is that in addition to the individual books, we're also selling something this year called mystery boxes. So this is, a, these are, this is an opportunity for those of you who are a little more adventurous in that side. So what you do is you choose a mystery box and those books in the box are one foot of books. So we stack them up uh, like this and you go through, you choose a mystery box and they are sorted by genre. So you can pick a box of books uh, and one price for 12 inches of books. And they are, again, all sorted by genre. So you can get surprised and maybe discover some new authors and some new books that you hadn't previously heard of. So to shop for the book sale, we ask you to visit fortmissoulamuseum.org. Uh, and fortmissoulamuseum.org is our website. So visit the website, click on the virtual book sale link, and you're able to go right from there and uh, shop the books that we have available. So with that, I wanna talk a little bit about the book that I have today. So I am going to read from Edgar Allan Poe's um, The Raven Editions, which is a beautiful book. Uh, you can see it's got some really wonderful, kind of macabre, but wonderful uh, illustrations in it. And I know personally, I've always uh, enjoyed Edgar Allan Poe's stories. I'm, those of you who know me know that I'm a fan of, of horror fiction and things like that. And of course, Edgar Allan Poe is one of the first people that really invented the genre of horror. Uh, the other thing I like about him, especially for a format like this, is the fact that uh, Edgar Allan Poe wrote short stories. So today I'm going to read to you uh, from the story, of Ca The Cask of Amontillado, uh, which is one of my favorites, uh, kind of a horrifying story, but it's a lot of fun. So I'm gonna go ahead and start and we'll read and sit back and enjoy. Uh, and I wish I had my, my pipe and my scotch today, but I guess I'm still at work, so uh, that's not gonna happen. Uh, so we'll go ahead and we'll start reading. So thanks again for tuning in. So The Cask of Amontillado, the thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length I would be avenged, and this was a point definitely settled, but the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unaddressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt, as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato, although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship of wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit. For the most part, their enthusiasm is adapted to suit the time and opportunity, to practice imposture upon the British and Austrian millionaires. In painting the gemerary Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack. But in this matter of old wines, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself, and brought or bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk one evening during that supreme madness of the carnival season when I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had a tight fitting part striped dress and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his hand. I said to him, my dear Fortunato, you are luckily met how remarkably well you are looking today, but I have received a pipe of what passes for a Montelado, and I have my doubts. How, said he, Montelado, a pipe? 
impossible. And in the middle of the carnival? I have my doubts, I replied, and I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You are not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado, I have my doubts. Amontillado, and I must satisfy them. Amontillado, as you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucchese. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me, Lucchese cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults. My friend, no, I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Lucchese, I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no, it is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go, nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Montelado, you have been imposed upon. And as for Lucchese, he cannot distinguish Sherry from a Montelado. Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm, putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a roquelaire closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I had told them that I should not return until the morning and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their sconces two flambeaux, and giving one to Fortunato, bowed to him several suites of rooms, bowed him through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent, and stood together on the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. The pipe, said he. It is further on, said I, but observe the white webwork which gleams from these cavern walls. He turned toward me, looked into my eyes with two filmy orbs that distilled the room of intoxication. Nitre, he asked at length. Nitre, I replied. How long have you had that cough? Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, my poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It is nothing, he said at last. Come, I said with decision. We will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy, as once I was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it was no matter. We will go back. You will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucchese. Enough, he said. The cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True, true, I replied. And indeed, I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily. but you should use all proper caution. A draft of this medoc will defend us from the dams. Here I knocked off the neck of a bottle, which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mold. Drink, I said, presenting him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly while his bells jingled. I drank, I drink, he said, to the buried that repose around us and I to your long life. He again took my arm and we proceeded. These vaults, he said, are extensive. The Montresors, I replied, were a great and numerous family. I forgot your arms. A huge human foot d'or and a field jour. The foot crushed a serpent rampant upon fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo me impune lasit. Good, he said. The wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the medoc. We, all, we had passed through the walls of piled bones with casts and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by, the, by an arm above the elbow. The nitre, I said. See, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the vaults. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back. Ere it is too late. Your cough. It is nothing, he said. Let us go on. But first, another draught of Medoc. I broke and reached him a, a flagon of de grave. He emptied it in a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upward with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masons. Yes, yes, I said. Yes, yes. 
You, impossible. A mason? A mason, I replied. A sign, he said. It is this, I answered, producing the trowel from beneath the folds of my roquelaire. You jest, he exclaimed, recalling a few paces. But let us proceed to the amontillado. Be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath the cloak and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descended again, arrived at a deep crypt in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt, there appeared another less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead, in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth, the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still inferior recess, in depth of about four feet, in width three, in height six or seven. It seemed to have been constructed for no especial use within itself, but formed merely the interval between two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs, and was backed by one of their cir circumscribing walls of solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depth of the recess. Its termination, the feeble light did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said, herein is the amontillado. As for Lucchese, as for an ignoramus, interrupted my friend as he stepped unsteadily forward, while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant he had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more and I had fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other about two feet, horizontally. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand, I said, over the wall. You cannot help feeling the nitre. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No, then, I'm, then I must positively leave you. But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontillado, ejaculated my friend, not yet recovered from the astonishment. True, I replied the Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have spoken before. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building, stone, and mortar. With these materials, and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Ortonado had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depth of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier, and the third, and the fourth, and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which that I might hearken to it with the more, with the more satisfaction. I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused and holding the flambeau over the mason work threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting suddenly from the throat of the chain form seemed to thrust, my violently, thrust me violently back. For a brief moment I hesitated, I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grow with it about the recess, but the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall. I replied to the yells of him who clamored. I re-echoed, I aided, I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this and the clamor grew still. It was now midnight and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last in the 11th. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position, but now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad sound, which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of noble Fortunato. The voice said, ha 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 ha, he he, a very good joke indeed, an excellent jest. 
We will have many rich laugh about it at the Palazzo. He he, over our wine. He he he, the Amontillado. I said. He 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 he. Yes, the Amontillado. But it is it it. But is it not getting late? Will not they be awaiting us at the Palazzo? The Lady Fortunato and the rest. Let us be gone. Yes, I said. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montresor. Yes, I said. For the love of God. But to these words I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud, Fortunato! No answer. I called again, Fortunato! No answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick on account of the dampness of the catacombs. I hastened to make an end to my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Again, the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace, rescia. And that's it. So that's it. That is the cask of Amontillado. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And again, thank you for taking a few, few minutes to, to join me here. And thank you so much for your support of the Historical Museum over the years and our annual book sale. We are certainly looking forward to a day where we can get back and have another in-person book sale. But in the meantime, please check out uh, fortmissoulamuseum.org uh, and take a look at the books we have for sale. Uh, again, thanks for tuning in and have a great day.